So my name is Casey Cobb, and my slides are not loading. There we go. So this is the business track, and today we're going to be talking about metrics and dashboards. And I think, uh, you know, just sharing a bit about myself and my company's I'm co-founder of a digital agency. We do Drupal and, you know, JavaScript stuff. Uh, I'm an angel investor. I do. I've co-founded several. Uh, startups and companies and you know more importantly in each of those companies you know kind of the thing that I do the thing that I, gets me up in the morning uh, is making metrics and dashboards it's like I, I love it so I'm really excited to be able to share this with you guys not just in digital agencies but and, and a lot of my examples are not just going to be Drupal stuff or programming I, I what I'd like to do in this talk is talk about the basic components of metrics and how to do this successfully. And I'm, I'm going to share some numbers about what we measure at, at Ricochet. I'm probably not going to share the specifics about what is ideal, because it's important to me that you guys realize that metrics are pretty personal. They're pretty uh, specific to culture. They're pretty specific to you know, how much you guys have developed and invested as individuals. They're specific to your role. They're specific to the politics in your organization. Every organization has politics. So I don't, I, I think this talk will be a little different than the talk yesterday. Did anybody attend the metrics talk yesterday? So they were talking about very specific numbers that you should achieve. And to me, as, a, as an agency owner, they were pretty relevant to me, and I understood all those. But uh, from this talk, you should be able to get out of it, even if you don't own an agency, even if you're an individual contributor or a developer or a project manager or an owner, um, you should be able to get stuff out of this. So first thing I want to start with is a quote from Peter Drucker. Does, it, does anybody know who Peter Drucker is? Any hands? Yeah, he's like the, he's like the godfather of, of modern management philosophy. He's written like 100 books, literally. And you know, the stuff that he taught and has said is crept its way into everything that, that we really talk about in terms of running business these days. Um, and I think this is really apt because when you measure something, Actually, if you're having a problem, what I think is so cool about metrics is that just the act of measuring it will oftentimes fix the problem. Because I, I don't know if you guys have heard the story about, um, I think it was like in the, the 1800s where they were trying to understand productivity. And they uh, were, were, this was in the factory floor. And they actually, yeah, they, they had the, the, everybody's working. And so they wanted to see the effect of light levels on people's behavior. And so they took the baseline and they turned down the lights a little bit. Um, and actually, they turned up the lights. And then productivity went up. They turned up the lights a little bit more. Productivity went up. And they're like, huh, they did that several times. And then they wanted to see, well, what if we take down the lights? They took down the lights from the original baseline, and productivity went up even more. Now, why was that? Because everybody knew that everybody, all the consultants were watching them. So they, <laughs> they worked really hard, right? So, but, but in an agency, um, I don't and I talk about this in other slides, um, that's not what metrics should be about. It shouldn't be about you're going to change your behavior to do something. It should be a reflection of how things are going um, so, to, to, so that you can improve them or you can see how good you're doing. So I want to start with some basic building blocks. And none of these building blocks are really all that technical. This isn't a talk. I'm not going to put code on the screen and show you how to do this stuff. If you have questions about implementing any of these things, this is what I love to do. So either find me or uh, shoot me an email, and I've got my contact info at the end of this slide. So before I do that, I'm going to keep going back and trying to give some background here. But there's a book that really influenced me a long time ago. It's a guy named Patrick Lencioni. Uh, it's The Three Signs of a Miserable Job. So these are, first one, it's not even a word, and he recognizes that, but it's a measurement. It's that you can't, in your role, you can't know how you're doing. You, you, you're on a treadmill. You never actually know if you're improving or doing well or doing poorly. Uh, you can't see how your behavior is changing anything significantly. And when you have that long enough, your job just kind of sucks. So it's up to us to not only fight to get that measurement, or if you're a leader or you're a manager, to give your people that measurement. The next thing is irrelevance. Um, you know, people don't see how uh, what they're doing actually matters. You could make metrics around that, or you could just tell somebody how, how that works. And anonymity, they don't feel that they're being 
uh, recognizes individuals. This is what Lencioni said. I haven't read this book in 15 years, but those three things have stuck with me. I didn't even have to look up this on Google or anything. I just remember these because they're pretty influential in my career, but the one that I want to talk about today is in measurement. And I'll talk about this stuff after, but when you can provide these three things, this is born its truth in you know, every role that I've been in, even from an individual contributor to a developer to an executive to an investor, these things are really key. And in measurement, uh, if you can do that well, things oftentimes end up falling together or coming together really, really easily. So um, first piece of advice in developing metrics. I always think of an incentive system or a measurement system of you're putting pressure on a wall. So you know, on the side of the highway, you have those little dividers. And you're going to be propping pressure on that. And people are going to behave in ways the wall is going to respond. Right? If you put too much pressure, that wall is going to topple over. So for instance, in customer service, if you put your metric of measuring call times, well then uh, people are going to like, if they got to get through calls like super fast, well they're going to zip right through them and the customers are going to be pissed off. And that's actually not a very good thing for customer service, right? You probably also don't want to measure like the longest call because then they'll just be yapping about whatever and then you have uh, hold times that are really long. So you got to make sure that when you do that, you also, if you're putting pressure on one side, you've got to put a support on the other side so that your wall doesn't topple over. So two examples, specific examples that I think illustrate this. First one is potty training my kid. Just recently, he's three and a half years old, three years old. Um, we, my wife decided to give him little Ninja Turtle cars uh, every time, like $2 at, the, at Target, every time he had a successful uh, one and two, right, in combination. <laughs> and so he had like 13 of these Ninja Turtle cars, pretty successful. However, at about, you know, like Ninja Turtle car number four or five, when we go at the end of the night before bedtime, he would sit on that potty for like hours. <laughs> if we didn't, if we didn't, uh, if, if he doesn't have to go, man, he just wants that Ninja Turtle car. So it kind of got disconnected, right? Like he wants the Ninja Turtle car. We want him to achieve a behavior. And how that actually ended up messing up or disrupting that is that then he's not going to bed on time. And then he has a routine that gets disrupted. And then that plays itself out with havoc with three-year-olds. Does anybody have three-year-olds in here or has had a three-year-old? It's a challenge, man. So uh, that is you know, a silly example, but that's how people are too. If you incentivize a certain behavior, they are going to do that behavior. So think about, you've got to think about what the possibilities can happen. And another thing, e-commerce orders. When I was executive at an e-commerce uh, uh, fulfillment uh, company, uh, we, the first iteration on our incentive system was we gave a reward for uh, getting out a certain number of orders in a day or an hour. And for every, what's called a QC, for everyone that came back as like, this was misshipped, you would get a, dedu you would get a, a subtraction from that bonus that you would have earned. So somebody figured out that they could actually make more money by just throwing stuff into boxes, not even counting it, and mm -hmm. shipping it out, and getting really high numbers, and the penalty for the QC was totally disproportionate. So she got a lot of QCs, but it didn't matter, because she was making a huge bonus, right? We didn't think about that extreme. And that was actually, I mean, of course, we gave her some feedback, and we, we coached her on that. We actually then adjusted the, the, the system to break down into uh, the finest component, and we actually started rewarding based on uh, you know, number of pro or individual products that were shipped with weight, and we had an accurate reflection of the quality control, the true cost of the company. So we figured out what a true cost of a QC was to us. We subtracted that from the bonus, and lo and behold, quality control uh, errors went down by orders of magnitude. Like it was something like seven or eight percent of orders that went out, and it went down to less than like 0.01 percent of orders over periods because people got better and better and better at it. They learned um, how to grow and, 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 and do this stuff more easily. So that was kind of an extreme case. And, you know, Peter Drucker talked a lot about knowledge workers. More often than not, you know, if in the warehouse work, we did find that a lot where people were just gaming the system because they really didn't care because they were going to be moving on within a couple months. Maybe it was even seasonal work. In our line of work, you know, we've got, we want folks for the long run. And they're thinking with their brains, not just with their hands. They're typically um, pretty sophisticated folks. So the, the, the main takeaway from, from this is that, you know, for the most part, what I've realized is that when people aren't succeeding or something isn't happening, it's usually not because of anybody's 
fault or because uh, people aren't trying really hard. Oftentimes they're trying really hard. They're just doing stuff in different parts that they think are important and maybe aren't actually important for the organization from your perspective as a leader. Um, and so, you know, I think there are reasons, there are deeper reasons why a given metric isn't being achieved. And, uh, you know, the metrics and performance should promote discussion and communication. We should be able to say, here's where we're at and how can we improve from there? So yeah, our, you know, you know in, in, in Drupal development, our QC rate or QA rate, reopened, tickets get reopened or the client, you know, doesn't accept that story, that user story, you could actually measure that. And that's not to say that people, you know, it is what it is. We've got a workflow issue or we've got a specification issue or we've got a client that's really difficult. The metric should, say, should, should allow us to discuss and say, how can we actually improve upon this? So a um, couple other baseline things. We're running a marathon, not a sprint. Um, the iterative mindset is key. So when you learn something from metrics, you should be, keep in mind that you're not going to get everything perfect from day one. You're just going to try to get incremental improvements, compounding effect. Um, start as simple as possible. So I think the most overwhelming thing about thinking about metrics is people think that they need to uh, get you know, this huge development effort and get this dashboard tool and you know, actually make uh, this really robust system that measures everything. You don't have to do that. You could make a really powerful metric system with Google Forms, right? Um, but I think it's important, and I'm going to talk about some tools that you can use for measuring metrics. You've got to get to the baseline unit. You've got to get to the smallest actual unit that is important to you. So that might be for us. Some of the numbers I'm going to share are very personal to Ricochet. Might not work for you guys. You've got to think about what's important. But uh, you know, for us, we get in like all of our JIRA data into the, like, all the tickets, all the transitions. We get in all of our time data, all the logging of the time. And that's a really rich data source. And then we pull in all our accounting data and we do all this references stuff. But if you actually, you could do this one of two ways. You could say, okay, well, I'm going to pull in, you know, I'm going to actually write some Node.js script to actually crunch all these numbers and store those, those, those actual values of the metrics I'm storing in the database. Um, that becomes problematic because then when you want to explore and discover the data and change it, you've got to now do a whole development effort. It would be better to get all that stuff in raw and some of the dashboard tools I'll show you will allow you to parse that stuff. Um, again, metrics are improvement, not blame. This is really key. If you, if you start off with blame, people are going to resist. They're not going to want to do it. And if you start with, you know, how can we improve it as a team, people are going to be a lot more receptive to that. Um, and like I said, break everything down to the lowest common unit. Us, it's time tracking and actual ticket data with a couple other things in there as well. But we have a series of MySQL tables that we just lay all that raw data in. And the only, the only efforts that we have to do or when we realize that something that we wanted, like maybe we didn't pull in some specific JIRA field, uh, we'll pull that extra field in, and then we've got the raw kind of data. So um, I want to share a, an interesting realization, kind of an epiphany that I had. It involved a garbage disposal, um, and it kind of, it, it really blew my mind. So uh, garbage disposal, I, I have a condo. My tenant called me and said, need a new garbage disposal. When I flip it on, um, all the stuff falls off the counter, like it shakes like a jet engine. I was like, wow, that sounds really intense and serious. <laughs> maybe I need to get a new garbage disposal. Maybe I need to get somebody to fix this thing. Uh, I, didn't, I don't know anything. I didn't know anything about garbage disposals. So I went down there and I took a look. And I looked at it. OK, everything looks normal. It does turn on. It does shake everything off the countertop. And I felt underneath that garbage disposal. And there's a little ring that holds the garbage disposal up against the sink. I just tightened that up half inch, almost nothing. Flipped it on, everything was super smooth, perfect. And I realized I had this like, you know, movie montage scene where I just like zoomed out and I was like, holy crap, that happens in my company. There's all these things that look really dramatic and crazy. And all that I have to do is tighten it up a little bit and then all of a sudden everything's super smooth. And it's even bigger in, in, in business because in companies are not just one garbage disposal. There's a thousand systems that work together and when one starts shaking, the other one starts shaking, the other one starts shaking, and it becomes exponential. And it looks really overwhelming, but if you can break it all down to the finest piece and then start tightening, I look at that as, and, and you don't have to be the owner of a company to do this. You can be an individual and find those loose rings and start tightening them up. And everybody's going to benefit from that, especially when you get the compounding effect. Um, you know, it helps your team's happiness, your work product, you as an individual, and everybody else. 
and the company's profitability. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of like a, a, I think there's a ton of examples in business like that, but it was, it was found in a very unexpected place. So, um, I want to share a concept that, that I've been trying to get out more. It's called accidental evil. Um, I'm still learning, I've been talking about it for several months. Uh, I'm still learning how to exactly define it. Um, if you Google Casey Cobb accidental evil, there's a Medium blog post that I wrote that I think really does it pretty succinctly. But it's basically when something, when, when people in an organization are doing their best, they, they are making a decision with the data that they have, and they basically have a path, two paths that they can go. They can do this or they can do that. And they pick the one that is easiest for them, or they pick the one that's the least amount of effort. And in this hypothetical universe, if they went the other path, it might have taken a little bit more effort, but the outcome would have been hugely better to the organization. So just a really quick example is, let's say you have, uh, let's say at your company, people don't uh, nail down the acceptance criteria super well at the beginning of the user story, and uh, you know, a client wants this thing, everybody talks about it, um, and people just start working, right? Uh, and the ticket ends up, uh, you know, causing issues, those tickets end up causing issues because they keep getting reopened and you get this huge backlog and, you know, the clients never, you're not delivering on your timeline because nothing's ever getting finished. Everything keeps getting like kind of tweaked from your perspective. The client just wants what they want. That creates a delay in the project and then everybody's got to work overtime to make this project hit the timeline. So everybody's working 60, 70 hour weeks to make this work. Um, to pull together, they make it work. But then that happens again. And then it happens again. And then it happens again. And eventually people start quitting because they love the company, they love you, but they just can't work 60, 70 hour weeks. It really sucks, you know? Eventually they just burn out. And if you just did something like nailing down that AC a little bit better at the beginning, uh, you would not have that effect because the project would go super smoothly the whole time. And you know, that to me is like accidental evil. It's like people don't even realize that that is happening. And the owner of the company might not even understand that that's happening. They might not even ever get that feedback. They're totally hands off of that. And so people might think, well, this company sucks. The owner's being a real jerk. He actually has, he or she has no idea that this is a problem and that that simple fix could actually create a much more optimal outcome. Um, and a small mm -hmm. tweak can produce exponentially better returns. I'd mm -hmm. really highly encourage you to read that blog post because I lay out some other examples that I think are really influential, but there's not been a single organization that I've ever been a part of, even my company now, um, there's accidental evil that happens all the time. And I think the idea is meant to empower us and our team members and you know, our direct reports and even our bosses to realize that when crappy stuff happens, it's not because anybody's being malicious, it's because just nobody realized. And organizations, organizations don't have souls. I mean, there's individuals who have souls and you can have these really weird byproducts when the organization will, will behave in these kinds of ways because it doesn't necessarily have a memory. Um, so, great, what should you measure? That's kind of what people oftentimes want to know. Um, and I, my response, like I said, it's very personal. Um, it's very cultural. It's very individual to your organization, but everybody has pain points. Everybody has things that, that aren't really working right now. Um, and what keeps you up at night? And you have the power to change the course of your organization through metrics, regardless of your place. And I think that's a really important point. Um, I would start with the simplest thing to measure. And you could literally do that making a Google form where so you just say, hey, anytime this thing happens or go parse the JIRA data or do a report on harvest and toggle and measure how many hours we recorded or what percentage of our you know, total time we should have billed versus what we actually billed and record it and then hit enter and let's just start collecting that. Can you do that for a month? Yeah, I can do that for a month. Okay, great. Or you do it for a month, right? And then take that data. That's a metric. That's a dashboard. It's not super elaborate. And I think it's important that we realize that doing this does not have to be this huge developmental effort. And as engineers, or most of us are probably engineers, we want to do that. We want to make it super elaborate. And that oftentimes prevents you from being able to do anything. And that's really, really important. Um, start with the simplest thing. Dev time can be a hard sell to the organization, especially when people are overworked because they don't have the metrics. Nobody has time, but ironically, having the metrics would let them have time to make the metrics. So if you can find tools like Zapier, or If This Then That, or you know, like I said, human beings, you, click this button, run these numbers. It only takes one minute a day. No time at all. You can do it. And so just do it. 
and then just see where it takes you. Use that as a springboard for further discussion. Like I said, it's a marathon, it's not a race. How can you iterate and get better and better and better? That is, I think, the, the key to success in anything, from life to business to you know, just figuring out how to get a little bit better every single time. Um, so let's talk about some specific things that we measure at Ricochet. Um, and this might create some discussion in the question and answers. I want to preface this, like I've said this many times now, these are very specific to us. We've been doing metrics and dashboards for many years now, so we've got stuff locked down. I mean, everything is super, super crystal clear, I think, and that's the feedback that I get. Um, so I'll just share some metrics that I found really interesting and, and some interesting stories that I've kind of found as a result of that. So ticket burn percent um, as the developer. So this is what's on the developer dashboard. There's actually a lot of, a lot of metrics, but I want to know when I talk to my team every week because we have weekly one-on-ones. My partner and I have weekly one-on-ones with each individual member, uh, team member, 30 minutes every single week. Um, we just go down these numbers as a part of that 30-minute one-on-one ticket burn. How are they doing on their tickets? Uh, are you know they they over our estimate on the ticket, and if so, why? And are there some problems that we could help uh, kind of get out of the like you know get in front of, or are they really struggling with something? And can we connect people? Because sometimes it's really hard to, I mean, we've all been, if you have developed, you've been in that situation where you're always almost done. You know, like you're always almost done. And you keep sitting there and you keep programming. You're like, I'm almost there. And then you look up and like eight hours have passed. You're like, oh shit, <laughs> this is way more than I expected to actually spend on this. That can really eat into the profit of the ticket. So I want to see that stuff very early. We cheat at Ricochet on Agile. Agile says, don't put time, just put user, point, user story points. Reality is that everybody knows what a point corresponds to, and they use that um, in terms of complexity. So we just have a scale, and we just say a point goes to, you know, uh, a point is 15 minutes, or three points is three to four hours. Um, and I do that. I, I mean, I, people talk to me about this all the time. I do that very specifically because uh, if you time box something, it will take less time. There's a thing called Parkinson's Law. Uh, something expands the amount of time allocated. And to just say it's just going to be whatever it's going to be seems to me really scary. It ends up taking a lot of time. And if somebody says, oh, I got to do this in an hour from the planning poker, everybody thought they could do it in an hour, and a new developer comes into this and goes, oh, somebody said that this was an hour? Well, how could they even possibly think that? And then they talk about it and they go, oh, right, there's that module. I don't need to do this from scratch. So we eliminate a lot of uh, that riffraff that can happen very early on. And in our management, I want to see that those tickets don't exceed 100%. Um, and we're actually, as a company, we come in at, for the past year, at 96% of our estimates. So we're super highly accurate. Um, tickets without acceptance criteria, tickets without estimates, tickets without a proper user story, like as a user role, I need this thing so that some business value is delivered. We have to put that in every single story. Because my philosophy is how can you really deliver on the value of the story if you don't know why people are asking? Because the client will say stuff like, I want this database table. Well, why do you want that database table? Well, because uh, I do. And it's like, well, you're asking for some business value, and I think I can solve that in a really simple way. So these are meant to do that. And by the metrics of seeing that every story has that, we get ahead of all those problems that will happen downstream. Next thing, I call these things zombie tickets. Tickets that just stay in the sprint, ticket, or, uh, sprint after sprint after sprint. You see the count. As the owner of the agency, you know, we're at the size, and I want to be at the size, uh, about 25 people, where I can, I can laser in on this stuff, but it doesn't have to be me. It could be anybody who is managing this. The developer may not be aware that that's, that user story is happening, uh, that it's the zombie. It just never dies. And I know that any time the client has exploded on us, it has been because of a zombie ticket. Like this thing, they just go, why the hell has it been six months and we haven't got this story done? It's like, I didn't even know about it. Let's take a look. And they have, there's good reasons, but when I see that it's been in three sprints, I just ask about it, and then that can sometimes unblock things. And then ticket reopened rate, it was pretty interesting to me to see that I had this epiphany that um, you might finish a story on the estimate, but who's to say, just like the girl who was packing orders, throwing stuff into boxes and shipping them, who's to say somebody just didn't finish it and say, okay, I'm done, all done. Well, if the client doesn't accept it, that's either because it wasn't done well, or the acceptance criteria wasn't clear, or 
who knows why, but it's up to the, the, in, the, the team that is delivering this ticket to make sure that the client is going to accept it. It might also be that the client's crazy. And if that's the case, then we have a discussion about that, right? We talk with the client and explain to them how this, all this stuff helps them. But I just want to see that number. And we actually know what the averages are for all these things. And I know that if somebody is higher than the average, then maybe that's a problem, maybe it's not. But at least we look at it. And usually when we look at it, um, it ends up not becoming an issue. And we can get ahead of that crazy client you know, phone call where they're screaming at us. Um, it just doesn't happen if you can find those zombie tickets early. Um, and, and reopen rate is low. Uh, OK, so next, plan time accuracy. Like I said, this is very specific to us. We wrote a, we have, we've written several internal tools. Um, and by the way, guys, I see some people taking pictures. We're going to put all this stuff, I'm, we're going to post this, so it'll be on the session uh, website. And you feel free to download it and, and, and shoot me with any questions. But um, we actually make a plan every single day. It pulls in all of our JIRA data, pulls in all of our calendars. Everybody makes a plan. And then they submit that. And then the next day, you see your accuracy, how well you did, and how many uh, unscheduled things got pulled in that you didn't originally plan to work on. And my theory is the reason I want to track that, and I actually look at it, we look at when somebody's plan time goes really down, or excuse me, if it's super high, that's great. But that to me means that the organization, more often than not, is throwing stuff at people and they're just responding because of fires. And why do we have fires? I don't know, it could be any one of a thousand reasons, but if somebody, if I see somebody's plan time is low, it's probably not their fault. It's probably my fault as a leader. It's probably the company's fault because we're doing some things that that person is just, oh, can you deal with this fire? Now can you deal with this fire? Now can you deal with this fire? And eventually people get sick of that and they quit. <laughs> so if you can get that stuff really early, um, you can get ahead of that and not have that burnout that can be associated with that. Developer accuracy um, versus the team. Um, this was really interesting to me because originally I said, okay, well, what is, I, I just started digging in the data because we have a tool that lets us dig in that base data. And I found that I wanted to see what is the average story size at our company. The average user story, it, it, it fluctuates over time, but somewhere around 2.2 hours uh, is a standard user story at Ricochet. And like I said, this is very personal. Some companies, their user stories might be eight hours. Some might be a week. This is just for us. I like to keep things super granular. Um, and if somebody's uh, uh, coming in at their, their uh, you know, burn, I can actually measure the burn of, on the tickets overall. When a ticket gets closed out, what was your accuracy over the past six months? And I can see if somebody was 80% or 120% coming in under or 100%, are they super accurate? So with those two kind of uh, uh, metrics, I'll show you in the next slide, we're able to do some pretty powerful stuff. But the, originally, we were just saying your accuracy. How much did you come in on your tickets at the end of that, that period, whatever it was? You could change it. And we could have a discussion about that. Um, and you know, like I said, I'll say the one-two punch on that because that's kind of a dangerous thing to do. Uh, or it's kind of misleading, it's not dangerous. The last thing here is scheduled versus actual accuracy. Um, this is actually like as a resource, resource planning. Um, when we say that we're gonna be working you know, 100 hours on a client's project this week, did we? Or did we not? And when somebody says, when we, when we allocate somebody's time, you know, 25 hours to work on a project, did they do it or did they not? I want to see that. And I want to have discussions about why they didn't, if they didn't. And it might be for a very good reason. It might be that we have to change as the leadership of the company how we're going about doing things to make sure that somebody is actually able to do what we asked them to do and what they said they would do and, uh, and what we committed to our clients. That has to happen. And if it's not, the metric should be promoting that. So that's why we measure that. So um, this is, this looked fine earlier. I don't know why this, oh, I think it's just the presentation, the resolution. But this kind of blew my mind. Um, one of our developers, we were going over all of the accuracy. And when we first did it, some people were coming in at like 50% of their estimates. Seems really good, right? Some people were coming in at like 140% of their estimates. And I realized, well, I'd rather somebody come in at, at like 95% of their estimates because they're not going over. Um, if you're too low, that means that when we actually create an estimate for a client or a proposal, if people come under their estimates, when we actually do a planning poker and we deliver a proposal, we're going to look like we're going to be way more expensive than we would actually be. That's a bad thing. Um, so it's like something that's actually misleading. Um, and then if somebody's coming in over their estimates, well, that seems like it's a bad thing too. 
It could actually be that they're just not good at estimating. It could be that they're taking way too long to do things or not paying attention to the time. But we had something really interesting where somebody, I was going over the feedback with, with, with the team. We had one guy that was coming in at 60%, one guy that was coming in at 140%, and I was coaching the guy that was coming in at 140%. I said, hey, how do we get your accuracy down to less than 100%? He said, well, let me think about it. Next week we came in and he said, I figured it out. I said, what is it? He said, I need to estimate higher. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, well, that's like saying you're going to go on a diet and just wearing sweatpants, right? It's like, yeah, okay, problem solved. All my pants fit now. Um, and I started thinking, like, what's to prevent everybody from just estimating higher? There's no prevention for that. And people will do that unintentionally. They won't even realize that they're doing it if uh, you start measuring that. So that's where that average ticket size, that 2.2 ticket size comes in. So I made a ratio, and I said, okay, What's the average ticket size, and what's their average ticket size, and that'll create a ratio that will be somewhere above or below one. So you can see the math here. So the employee accuracy uh, times that ratio is their adjusted accuracy. So I'll give you two examples that look uh, different. So in this case, this person was 90%. He's coming in right on target, pretty much, below 100%. Great, right? Well, maybe not, because his average ticket is 2.7 hours, and the average of the company is 1.9 hours. And when you multiply that by 90%, you get 127%. So that means he's actually coming in, he's overestimating by a, a disproportional amount to how he is coming in under. So that gives him feedback. That says, hey man, he's either, one of two things is happening. He's either on projects that are more complicated than average, which is definitely possible, and I know those projects, um, and you can adjust for that, or he's just estimating too high, um, in which case he should estimate lower, probably. And he gets that feedback, which is really powerful because we never get feedback, right? We may not even put estimates on tickets other than points. You never know how long it actually took unless it took way too long and you get in trouble. And then the final project is totally different than what it was when you thought you were going to originally make it because the client changed their mind a million times. So you never actually get that feedback loop. So this allows us to actually do that. And since we've done that, our whole team is super accurate now. The other situation here, this person's coming in at 120%. Well, that is a problem, right? Well, maybe not, because that person's average is 1.5 hours, the company's average is 1.9 hours. When you multiply that, he or she is actually coming in at 95%. So they're coming in under their estimates. It just means that they're estimating too low. So when I did the math, that guy who said, I need to estimate higher, he did actually need to estimate higher. When I did the math, he was underestimating exactly proportionally to the amount he was going over on his estimates. Exactly. So in that case, that was exactly what he needed to do, go higher. So that, to me, blew my mind that by digging through the data, we could give somebody that targeted feedback. And that's what metrics can do. Since then, we figured out how to get more and more accurate. Um, so project management. We were actually, uh, this is something that we're improving over time. And we actually, t uh, yesterday, the PMs and my partner and, and I sat down and talked about what exactly do they want to see? Because there's a lot of metrics there, and it's kind of overwhelming. Um, but in a nutshell, you know, the, the most important things are tickets that are problems in the project so they can get in front of that. Um, the status of tickets in the workflow. Are all the tickets going to be on stage on time for the demo? Or are they going to be ready for the release? Or um, are they going to get bunched up in QA and then the developer, a bunch of them are going to get reopened the day before the demo and then the developer's got to work extra hours that day to fix everything and then he's got to say like I've actually gotten this feedback and since then the metrics are helping us improve that he says it really sucks that we have a two week sprint and the day before the demo these things all get reopened and then I've got to fix them when we had two weeks the tickets were ready two weeks ago or a week ago there's no reason why this was had to happen but it just happened because it happened so um, can the PM identify those tickets and make sure that that's going smoothly um, the team allocation across all projects uh, so that they know for resource planning, they know if people are actually delivering on their hours commitments, um, they know if, when, when, uh, if the project is on track or not, sprint tidiness, does everything have acceptance criteria, estimates, uh, you know, proper user story, and then sprint completion. Are we on track to deliver what we said we were going to deliver? Um, and then there's other stuff like budget and, and, and things like that, um, which we've got to, tools for as well. So I want to talk about the Swiss cheese model of fault tolerance. Does anybody know what this is? So um, this is the, in this idea, imagine when you make a defense against something happening, imagine that, that 
that thing is a, is a piece of Swiss cheese. It has all the holes in it, right? Things are going to slip through that Swiss cheese. Things can get through. If they hit it just right, sometimes they'll hit the wall of the Swiss cheese. Sometimes they'll go straight through and you'll have that problem. If you get two pieces of Swiss cheese, well, some of those holes are going to overlap. So the likelihood that something's going to get through is now less. If you have three, you're still probably going to have little tiny holes here and there. Some stuff's probably going to still get through. If you have four, you're probably getting pretty close to being pretty well covered. My thing is, I want these metrics to be layers of Swiss cheese, and I want to have as many as I can to ensure that issues don't happen. Um, and the more that you can do that, the more levels or layers of Swiss cheese you can do, uh, the more robust you can actually, uh, your organization will be, and the more you'll uh, kind of lose, uh, you'll lose those fires that happen uh, or put them out early. So how can you reinforce your culture and your values through your metrics? I'll, I'll just ask you guys that. Like, you just think about it, a rhetorical question. If you have things that you want to have happen, at Ricochet, I want our process to be super buttoned up, and I want everybody to be focused on uh, doing, there's, there's actually an ancient spiritual text, the Tao Te Ching. Does anybody know what the Tao Te Ching is? There's a couple of people um, on my team. I, I talk about it a lot. Somebody else here. It's, it's an amazing book. Uh, you could spend hours just thinking about one sentence. It's a 5,000-year-old Chinese um, philosophical text. And one of those expressions is the Zen master comes in, works when he works 100%, and when he's done, he puts his tools down, doesn't think about work anymore. His mind is clear. I want our developers and our project managers and our business development people to be able to do that. I want them to be able to come into work, do exactly what they were put on this earth to do, their dharma, um, and be happy, and then when they're done, be able to be, go enjoy their lives and spend time with their kids and go to, you know, uh, uh, stuff after work. And I want our metrics to reinforce that. That's why I want everything so buttoned down or so buttoned up because um, if you don't, people are always thinking about work because they never know what's going to bite them around the next corner. And that's really stressful. And so I try to reinforce that through all these metrics. Um, business development. So uh, I do, I, I, I prescribe to the... Um, the, the, the uh, personality assessment tool DISC. Do, do people know what DISC is? Um, it's an amazing tool. Uh, I use it with everything. I, I actually had my wife take the DISC when we first met. And, <laughs> and we, had, uh, we had some discussions about the conflict that we were going to have, which she didn't want to hear anything about. Um, but we actually use that in our marriage. Like, you know, she tells me not to be so high D or high C, and anybody who knows DISC will, will know that, that you know, those can be things that now you can vocalize uh, things that otherwise you're just a jerk, right? Now you have a thing that is actually a strength, but in certain contexts you kind of seem like an asshole. So, um, you know, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's the same thing. So in business development, for, for me, a successful business development person is going to be on DISC, super high D, which is like really, you know, intense, dominant, you know, in your face, like, like me, basically. Um, and also they're going to be I, which is very salesy. They know a ton of people. They, uh, you know, aren't going to be reading spreadsheets. They're just, if they have a problem, they're going to solve it by calling their friend um, or their contact or whatever. No, no, a million people that can solve any given problem. Challenge with that is that they might be all over the place um, if left to their own devices. They oftentimes need the structure of the C, which is the systematic quality. There's only really four attributes and then mixes in DISC um, between those attributes. So I want to be able to support my business developers high C and really celebrate and allow them to be the high D and the high I. So how do you do that? Well, how we do it is we actually have all the things that business developer should be doing in JIRA and they just track their time to those epics or those ticket numbers and then we can actually see the breakdown of their time. And they set how much time they should be spending on that stuff and then we see if they actually did that. I don't even have to comment about whether the mix is appropriate. I just want to see that they actually did what they planned to do. That's it. Um, and, and this allows us to do that. One of the companies that um, I'm an advisor for, uh, the business developer there, they don't have JIRA and time tracking software. So I found this really cool app, Timely app. The business development marketing guy there can go make his windows of time in a calendar, and he can actually track his time according to each of those events, and then he can see where he landed. He's really excited about that. And then we can have discussions about where he does and doesn't spend his time. And that's pretty cool because it allows him to stay on track and it allows us to have discussions if he's not able to do some of the things that he set out to do. 
Um, obviously, the easy stuff, pipeline into the future for a digital agency, social media metrics, you can come up with a ton of things. And there's all sorts of tools out there. My point is just pick the, the things that you think are important and then just track them. It's pretty easy. Um, doesn't have to be high tech. So agency leadership. Um, what do my partner and I look at? So we look at our revenue targets being achieved. Are our worked versus scheduled time for both projects and individuals being achieved? How is our PM billable percent versus project percent, like what they're actually billing their time to that maybe isn't billable but it's an internal project? Um, team feedback. Have people given feedback to the rest of the team? And in particular, have my partner and I given feedback to the team? We actually track that. We look at that. And uh, my partner always tries to beat me, but he never can because I give a ton of feedback. It's very structured, and we'll talk about that. It's like when you do this thing, here's what happens. Great job. Keep it up. Try to give you know, way more positive feedback than negative feedback, but just giving basic feedback. And then uh, we measure that, um, and I always win. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's important. I'm a high D. And then uh, accidental evil per week. We actually have like a little Dr. Evil button in our little app. And anytime anybody sees this, they click that button. Um, and I do that because I want people to feel empowered by the idea that when crappy stuff happens, it's probably not because somebody is an asshole. It's probably just because they had no idea that that was actually happening. It's a huge idea. When they can click that button and say, yeah, that sucked. Click it. They don't have to record anything else. I, in a one-on-one, -on -one can then say, like, hey, what happened there? Or if they are clicking a bunch, I actually don't, you know, one or two or a couple isn't a big deal. I see somebody's clicking a bunch. Well, then, you know, let's talk about this. What's happening that really sucks so that we can improve that. Um, so uh, the dashboard tool. What do we use for a dashboard tool? There's a bunch out there. Um, the one that we started with a tool called Duxboard. It lets you actually process the data and then stick the kind of the pre-processed metrics into a dashboard and then it would show the actual chart and you could kind of graph it. Um, that actually got bought by New Relic and then they closed it down. Um, and then th we actually found a tool called periscopedata.com they were actually periscope.io for a while. I was like, they're never gonna, like, Twitter's gonna send them a cease and desist soon. And they did, so they changed it to Periscope data. Um, but what it allows you to do is actually make a widget, and you can just create your MySQL query. And you can do joins, and they have all sorts of helper functions. You can, you can do joins across databases, um, and you can create graphical representations or charts or tables. And so you could come up with any idea you want and dig into the data and see how it actually affects things. You may not even share it. You might just want to know how that, how, how that looks. And all of our metrics have been that. We just sat down and made a bunch of tables. And when you actually start visualizing it, um, it's just really interesting. Like I remember my business partner went in and he was like, I wanted to see people's time entries and how they, like did people have a lot of starts and stops or did they have really long ones or did they work in you know, separate windows? And he made this really cool scatter plot of all their time. It was one of those things that you look at one time and you're like, wow, that's pretty interesting. It's not really actionable, um, but it was really cool. It looked really neat. And you could, and we just threw that chart away. But you could make those things, and, and Periscope allows you to do that. I don't have any interest in the company. I just think it's a cool tool. Um, so there's other ones you can do as well, but uh, you can pull in your PM software. We use Jira, resource planning. We actually wrote our own resource planning tool, and we have an API. We pull that data in. Your CRM, your financial suite, we use Xero. All those have APIs and you can ingest that data and stick it into a database and read that with Periscope. Um, so tying it all together, uh, how do you do that? Well, I mentioned the 30-minute th one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely key. If you're measuring all this stuff and you're never actually communicating it to people, it's not going to have much value. Uh, I think that I strongly believe that anybody who's managing other people, if you're a small organization, you're the owner, you should be doing that. Um, if you are a project manager, and in your company, you're kind of like a manager of developers, well, you should be having one-on-ones. At our company, we want to be at the size where we can, the owners can do those one-on-ones. But it doesn't matter. Um, I was talking with Todd of Four Kitchens, and he was saying, well, he does not want to be a manager. He wants to be doing the big picture stuff. And so he actually hires managers, and those people do that. Um, whatever, whatever works. But the one-on-one -on -one is really, really powerful, and the, the feedback that I most often get uh, is that they don't have time to do one-on-ones. But what actually ends up happening is if you do those, it saves so much, tire, uh, so much time because you have so many less fires. You're going over these metrics regularly. You're talking with them. You're finding issues before they become giant sprouts or giant trees. You're killing them when they're little sprouts. You get way more time back. Everybody does. 
Systemic feedback, I just mentioned the structure of that. I give it all the time. Anytime I see anything that's good, it's really cheesy, it's the same thing over and over again. People know that, they know about feedback. I just think it's important to share with people when they're doing something great or when they're doing something that can be improved in a very direct way that's not emotional. It's just, it's what it is. And then coaching for growth and improvement. I've never seen somebody not, when, when they weren't succeeding, um, I've never seen somebody not succeed from really dedicated coaching about what was expected from them. And uh, I think somebody was sharing with me that they went to a session before, slow to hire, quick to fire. Um, we are slow to hire, we're slow to fire as well. Uh, because I want to give somebody a real uh, fair shake. And, you know, I think that uh, this is kind of the stuff that Peter Drucker uh, kind of pioneered. And if you go to managertools.com, they, uh, this is where I learned all this stuff, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, really, really powerful, but the coaching for growth and improvement, you say, hey, here's these metrics we have. How can you achieve these numbers? You're not achieving these numbers. And if you have somebody who you don't know how to coach because you don't know what the numbers are, well, maybe that should be your first step. How do you actually give them the ability to measure how to improve instead of just saying, figure it out, dude, because um, they're trying their best, maybe, and they just don't know how, or they, there's something that you're doing to them that's preventing them from being able to do that. Make the numbers, set the goal, and then coach them to improve that, and you will probably learn just as much about your organization and yourself to get to that, um, get to that level. And, uh, you know, I, I say this a lot, but it's all about love. Management is all about love, and metrics are all about love. They should be. They shouldn't be a, a newspaper that you whack people with. How can you keep everybody happy at your company? How can you keep your clients happy? How can you really love the fact that, you know, we're all in this together from an agency perspective and a global perspective? Metrics should allow us to do that. And I think if you come at it from a really, uh, from that perspective, the metrics are going to be more effective. People aren't going to be afraid of them. They just realize you're trying to get better. So. I um, just wanted to highlight that point. And uh, I went through this a little more quickly. I didn't think I was going to have time for questions, but it looks like I will. Um, and if your, your question doesn't get answered, reach out to me, Twitter, Casey Cobb, Casey at ProjectRicochet.com. Love to answer any questions. I, I love this stuff. So uh, any questions? I know this is a lot to, to take in. None? What's up? I'd have to know about the specifics there, but government's kind of a tricky thing, right? Because they're not going to give you more resources oftentimes. Like, I like business and the market because all these metrics tie back to actually basically profitability. Like, you want people to be happy, but happier people are more profitable people, profitable people in the service. So, you know, it, it, if, you, if there's a number that, uh, if that's true, when you implement these things, you should have more profit, you should have more resources, you should have more money at the end of the day, and that can pay for the effort to do that. So it would, we can talk after, and maybe we can, we can kind of bounce ideas off of each other, but like if I were in that situation, you know, I would, I would you know, find a way to either count that stuff. You know, like m maybe there's an API, or maybe, you know, like if I were thinking about it and my job was really crappy, I might find somebody who could do that for me and just, I'll pay them some amount an hour to do that because I don't want to do it or I'm too busy and then I'll use that to justify the results. I, who knows, there's, there's a thousand ways you could do it but let's talk after and we can brainstorm some ideas. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, if you are actually doing one-on-ones, sure, whatever else, Basically, I, I find that there's very few problems in an agency that don't get solved through increased communication. If you think about Agile and Scrum, uh, when we have, we have weekly you know, sprints for some project, we might have a weekly sprint or a bi-weekly sprint, um, and if, for a lot of projects, that's just fine. 
Um, when projects are really complicated or they're really hot and heavy or the client's a little bit more challenging, we move to a daily scrum model where we just stand, we have a daily stand up and we talk about that. We also have a daily company scrum, but I find that more communication the better. So to the note about you know, one on group, great. That's like a company meeting um, or a team meeting. But you need to have the one on one. You need to have the individual to individual because it's about that relationship. Um, and if your direct does not have, feel that they have that relationship, you know, they're not going to have an avenue for those problems, basically. And you're not going to get the feedback trickling up. People aren't going to share in a group the same that they're going to share in a one-on-one, -on -one, and you're not going to have the rapport. You're not going to have the jokes. You're not going to know about their kids. And, and the one-on-one -on -one is very specific. It's 10 minutes for them to talk about whatever they want, 10 minutes for you to talk about the company or what you want from them, and 10 minutes for their growth and improvement. Um, and you can't do that on one-on -on group, I mean, kind of by definition. So does that answer the question? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and, and if you go to managertools.com, they have all that, and they have tons of podcasts, hundreds of podcasts. Um, but uh, so ten minutes for uh, the person to talk about whatever they want. If they want to talk about their dog went to the vet and you know they're really sad about that, or their kid's graduation, or whatever, or how things at the company they want to improve it, let them. That's great. That's how you build that rapport. If um, and then the next ten minutes is for you. So I use that time to go over the numbers and the dashboards, and I talk about company initiatives and company projects and new team members or new clients or new whatever projects that we're working on. And then the last 10 minutes is for their growth. At Ricochet, most people are reading a book, and I say just read at least one page of that book every single week. Only one page. Everybody can read one page no matter how busy you are. And then we talk about that. We talk about how we can help them improve. We talk about issues that they're having with the company. How can we make them happier and more productive? And that's kind of how that breaks down. When you first start doing it, they take like an hour or two hours. And then once you get up past the backlog, then they start going more quickly. Anybody else? Questions? OK. Um, if you guys come up with an ex examples of accidental evil, I'm really interested in this idea. Um, shoot them to me. I'd love to have a discussion about it. This is a topic I'm really interested in. Um, and if you have any questions about metrics or anything, uh, just let me know. Thank you guys very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.